I might ask before I um, kick it off my colleagues, just on tax as well, um, stage three tax cuts, the mm. changes on that, I mean, broadly speaking, the independent teal movement, if you like, was supportive of the, the previous tax cut and now they're saying, well, the change was the right call to make. What do you say to your constituents that say, hey, we were struggling, someone in our household is worse off because of this change? What would you say to them about the next term where you might hold the balance of power? Look, I think if we deal with the here and now, the truth is I certainly spent a lot of time talking to my community about how I voted when it came to those stage three tax cuts. And when I stood up and, and spoke about them, the point I made very consistently is that the way the government went about that reform, I think, was pretty lousy, really. Um, you know, we went from a situation where one week we're being reassured that they would proceed in the shape they were and then seemingly overnight they were changed. And you're right, there are definitely people in my electorate who are now worse off. I spoke to one single mum who actually, you know, she earns a really good salary. She's not saying she doesn't, but she is a single mum living in a really expensive electorate. Mm. And she was relying on that tax break. She'd factored it impressed. in, right? You'd done your budget yeah, at that I did, point. Yeah, she'd done her budget. She'd factored it in. Now, I guess what I also know about my community, though, is that it is a very compassionate community. And on balance, the vast majority in North Sydney, nearly 70%, came back saying they were happy to see that reform. So as the representative for that community, that's how I chose to cast my vote. Speaking of your community, uh, the AEC could abolish North Sydney as part of a redistribution. How do you feel about that and why should North Sydney remain? Look, I think as far as federal seats go, North Sydney's been punching well above its weight for a really long time. It was one of the original federal seats and I think we've seen treasurers come from there. We've seen leaders, and I'm not implying that I'm a treasurer or a leader, but what I know about North Sydney is it's a highly engaged electorate. You know, these are people who care about our democracy, are prepared to fight for it and prepared to turn up. I think it would be a real shame if North Sydney disappeared. But at the same token, this isn't about me. And, I, you know, I think that's maybe the difference of doing politics independently. I'm not in here for a career. I'm not looking to be the treasurer. I'm looking to make sure the people I represent have their voices heard in this chamber. So if the AEC makes the decision that it's the North Sydney seat that needs to be rolled into other seats, I will do my best to help my community adjust to that and then I'll support those members that go on to represent so those you won't, seats. So you won't run? It will depend on how it falls. Um, you know, I certainly think Zali Stegel is doing an awesome job in Warringa. If a large portion of North Sydney goes into Warringa, I wouldn't see it as appropriate for me to run against Zali. Um, I guess the real question for me is what happens to the North in Bradfield, you know, and we know Bradfield is a really progressive seat. You know, there was a really strong independent candidate that rang there, Nic Nicolette Buller. She only just missed out. It's perhaps, I think it was the only Liberal seat in the nation that voted yes in the referendum recently. So there's a strong, there would be an argument for me that if my seat goes north, then it would make sense for me to, to run again. And certainly if North Sydney stays, I'm running again because I think, you know, the North Sydney community um, is really enjoying this experience of being able to speak to their member, their member listen and then know that member's coming straight into the office with the Education Minister or straight into the office with the Prime Minister and saying, this is what my community wants to know or this is what they want to see you do and then that's going straight back out to them on the ground. What do you make of the government's handling of this detainees issue and Claire O'Neill, the Minister's handling? Look, I think um, I want to step right back, actually, because we have a human rights issue in this country, first and foremost, whether it's our individual human rights or whether it is our track record for how we tr you know, treat people who are seeking asylum or, or refugee status in this nation. So many Australians are under the false impression that there is a human rights act in this country, that we have the freedom to free speech, that we have the freedom to religious practice. We don't. In fact, we're one of the only nations in the world, Western developed nations, that doesn't have a human rights act. So I've been working in the background on that as parliament, part of the parliamentary joint committee. And I think that's a conversation I'd like to see happen more broadly across our nation, because it defines who we want to be as a nation. As to the current circumstance around what's been happening with this immigration law, it, I think it's completely laughable. And um, not just laughable, I think all of us should shudder at the actions that we've seen our government take in an attempt to try and legislate against potential findings of a federal high court. Now, let's be really you know, clear, as a democracy, again, we have a separation of the judicial system and our government system. That's the very foundation of our democracy. And it, I made my feelings very, very clear yesterday when we saw that piece of legislation come in. I was briefed on it at 8.45am 
advised by the government that it would be through the House before question time, which is at 2 o'clock. House didn't start sitting till midday. Who briefed you? I was briefed by the Minister, Andrew Giles. And how so, long was that briefing? And were there other independents there for that briefing? So it Crossbench. was a whole of crossbench yeah. briefing. And we were able to take our staff in, so we had second sets of ears to listen to. Senators came into that briefing as well. Did he explain the urgency? Because that's emerged as a Look, question Look, that's today. still the main question, no. And I think so in the absence... So was he asked and He was asked, urgent. yeah, he was asked. And, and I think, what? Well, I think what has become evident on this urgency is this is all about the pending High Court decision. That's not the original... NXYQ or whatever it was. They this don't even admit to that. But no, yeah, they, they're that not way. admitting to that. But in the absence of a clearly stated reason on why this is so urgent, the only explanation is that it is an attempt to move ahead of the High Court's findings when it comes to this case. Yep. And I don't think that's good governance. And I think any Australian should be concerned. When your government starts acting that way, when they're moving... Before Christmas, we saw them move those other laws in the dead of night. We were recalled on a non-sitting day to debate a bill that had the effect of making it possible for any okay. Australian citizen to have their citizenship taken away from them past at 9 o'clock at night. But if they don't do anything... I mean, maybe this is the wrong bill, but if they don't do anything and the High Court just takes over and we end up without a mandatory detention system, isn't that a concern in terms of opening the floodgates of uh, illegal immigrants? Yeah, look, I think the really important thing here, it's not an either-or situation, Andrew. Like, the, you look at... So, to give you an example, in the US, they process anyone seeking asylum within 55 days. In the US... You go to Canada, you've got equally short timelines. Here in Australia, the longest person in detention is over 5,000 days. It's nearly 16 years. So I don't think there is any doubt that our detention system is broken. There is something really wrong with immigration and visa law in this country at the moment. But rushing to create knee-jerk laws like this is not going to fix that. And that's the conversation I've had with this government. It's lead us out of this, step back, look at what we need in terms of you know, detention processes. I don't think any Australian thinks someone should just be able to turn up and walk in, and that's okay. not what I'm advocating, but it needs to be done in a consistent way with our international human rights obligations. All right. That's all I'm Inquiry saying. Inquiry to come, perhaps more legislation to come as well. Carly Tink, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.